Okay, so the purpose of this revision video is to look at some of the principles surrounding the management of natural hazards. We're not going to look specifically at any case studies within this, um, but there are certainly lots of links that you can make to some of the examples um, that you have learnt about or will learn about within this hazards unit. It's worth probably starting off by just unpicking some of the key bits of terminology that um, relate to the management of natural hazards. We can think about managing hazards in a number of different ways, some more successfully for, for some hazards than other, another. Um, but prediction is probably one of the first steps that might be taken. And this is all about the ability um, to forecast events and give warnings to people so that action can be taken. So trying to maybe predict and to forecast um, when a volcano might erupt um, or when a tropical storm might actually hit land. Protection, on the other hand, is very much about modifying the built environment. This isn't about protecting people um, indirectly. This is about actually um, thinking about the way in which buildings are constructed, um, the modifications we might make to infrastructure to mean that when an earthquake does happen, that those buildings don't collapse, for example. So protection is all about the built environment. Then there's another phrase called risk sharing or also um, kind of incorporates the idea of what we might call preparedness. Preparedness is anything that we're doing in advance of um, a natural hazard that aims to reduce the damage um, that could involve um, educating the public about the steps that they might need to take. Um, it might involve evacuating people from an area maybe stockpiling or preparing emergency supplies, um, or even something like taking out insurance is a good example of risk sharing. Um, if people living in somewhere that is prone to a hurricane take out storm or flood insurance, um, then everybody's paying into that scheme every year, but actually they might not claim on that insurance every year. Um, and therefore that risk is shared out amongst the entire population who are paying into, um, into that scheme. We can then also think about resilience as being an important part of, of hazard management. Um, particularly in low income countries, we want to make sure that communities and um, people are resilient enough to be able to withstand and respond to and bounce back from hazards um, within uh, you know, a reasonable amount of time and, and not suffer their effects for too long. So they're the key ideas behind managing hazards. And there are lots of specific examples for each individual hazard of how we predict or protect or um, prepare. But those are the broad ideas that run through all of this stuff about hazard management. We can also think about applying the concept of um, some models to the management of natural hazards. So here we have an image of what we call the hazard management cycle. Um, and you can see it does take on this idea of, of a cyclical format whereby um, in the build up to a disaster, things might be happening. We experience a hazard in a particular place and then certain things unfold after that hazard has occurred, which eventually kind of leads back into the next hazard. Um, and this is quite sensible, really, because if we think about somewhere being prone to um, earthquakes or to volcanic eruptions or to tropical storms or to wildfires, it's very, very unlikely that somewhere would be exposed to one of those hazards only once. P people living in those environments are continually exposed to those hazards over time. So actually thinking about um, hazards and how we manage them as a bit of a cycle is really important. Now, we can go into a little bit more depth, I suppose, and think about what some of the activities might actually look like within each of these different stages um, of the, the hazard management cycle. So we have initially this blue phase here, this pre-disaster phase. This is the bit that's going on um, before the hazard actually happens. And you could argue this is probably the most important 
step that people can take to manage hazards. It's actually what we do before they occur rather than what we do afterwards. Um, so risk assessment might involve um, identifying areas of potentially higher risk. So all of the examples here relate to an earthquake. So it might be somewhere um, that has particularly soft bedrock or um, very old buildings. We're trying to assess and work out, well, where are the areas that are most at risk? And then thinking about what we can do about that. It might be that we go um, as a form of prevention or mitigation in terms of actually retrofitting buildings to make them earthquake proof. Um, it could be that in terms of preparedness, we think about educating local people through earthquake drills, like they hold one on the uh, 1st of September in Japan every year, um, making sure that people are prepared in terms of stockpiling things in their, their homes should they have to evacuate um, little bags that they can take with them. Then following the disaster, we enter this kind of response phase. And this is very much um, focused on kind of saving people's lives and dealing with their um, initial kind of basic needs of food and water and sanitation um, and things like that. So it might involve search and rescue teams alongside local residents searching for and saving people. It might be that um, aid is required to a certain area. And again, that might come internally from within a country if it's a high income country um, or low income countries might require international assistance in helping to respond to the needs of people in the short term and certainly assessing the damage that's been done and working out which buildings are safe or not for people um, to return to. Then we start to move into this post disaster phase whereby we start to think about maybe the, the recovery um, of that area. Now, that may take a significant amount of time, depending on the amount of damage that's been that's been caused. Certain things that people might want to do to start with, things like establishing um, important services such as hospitals and ports, getting those very, very essential services back up and running so that um, maybe goods can be re-imported back into the country, especially if that is aid that needs to be um, continued for a significant period of time. Governments might offer money to people, um, so settlement to people, um, to move out of a location at risk. Um, they might spend money reinvesting in local businesses, trying to establish um, workforces, trying to get people um, jobs, um, or even trying to set up maybe new infrastructure and services like um, new schools and sanitation facilities and things like that in the long run. And ultimately, you can see here that this risk assessment and mitigation bit actually kind of feeds in to the next cycle of this disaster. So we can think about disaster management and risk management being um, a cyclical event. It's not just something that happens once. It is an ongoing process. Another model that we can use to think about um, disaster management and disaster response is what's called the disaster response curve, also known as the park model. Um, the park model is a measurement or a sort of representation, if you like, of the measurement of um, a few key things within a society. So maybe the quality of life or the level of economic activity, social stability, um, the levels of communication and services. We're measuring that on this axis. And as you can see, um, over time, we chart through the stages of um, impact and recovery um, to any particular natural disaster. On this scale, we can think about um, starting off at a, at a level of what we might call normality. So this is what the area was like pre-disaster. It's then going to experience some kind of hazardous event, whether that's an earthquake, tropical storm, a volcanic eruption. And as a result of that event, there's going to be significant disruption to all of those things that we're measuring on this axis. After an earthquake, the quality of life and levels of economic activity and social stability, they're all going to decline quite significantly. And then eventually things will pull back upwards and things will return to normality. Or they may actually even improve. If people's houses are being built um, in a way that is much stronger, 
uh, much higher quality after an earthquake, for example, then actually you could argue that some places might experience an improvement in the quality of life. Um, however, you could also argue that some places never quite get back to normal and actually their recovery kind of takes on a on a path a little bit like this where that road to recovery is much, much slower. And that's certainly been the case in places like Haiti in the Caribbean. We're over 10 years on from that earthquake now. And you could argue that some parts of the capital have still not fully recovered um, from that earthquake, even though it actually only took about 30 seconds for all of that initial disruption to happen. As well as um, the hazard management cycle being divided into stages, again, we've got four stages along this set of the model. We've got the pre-disaster stage before anything happens, and then we've got three phases after that. Relief, which is all about the initial life-saving and um, emergency measures that people need. The rehabilitation of maybe starting to get communities back onto their feet, and then the reconstruction of getting things back to normal. Now, although the park model, the disaster response curve, does give some indication of, of time scale along the bottom here, hours to days, days to weeks, weeks to years, actually, this is very, very generic. And for any individual hazard, the park model would look very different. So as I mentioned, somewhere like Haiti has taken a long time to recover. Um, other nations might bounce back much more quickly um, from any particular disaster. So we want to take these models with a little bit of a pinch of salt. They're not a perfect representation of what happens in reality, but they are quite a good way of just modelling and reflecting on what happens um, in real life. It's important that we think about the usefulness of these models as well. So we want to be able to evaluate their usefulness in helping us to understand how places are affected or how they recover um, from a natural hazard. With regards to the hazard management cycle, um, this is quite good because as I've said already, it takes into account the steps taken before a hazard, uh, which the park model doesn't do. Um, it considers perhaps how one hazard leads into the next. Um, and it focuses perhaps more on the management of the event rather um, than the impacts it has. You could argue that it might provide quite a useful model of action. So if a particular country or community was wanting to think about how it might respond to um, a disaster, then actually using that model can provide um, quite a good set of steps to follow. But on the other hand, it doesn't really give any indication of time scale. Um, although the park model does do that, the hazard management cycle doesn't. So on the other hand, um, the park model might allow us to compare the significance of um, an event with normality because we've got this sort of um, relative scale down the y-axis. Um, and therefore it can help to maybe indicate the magnitude or the severity of, a, of an event. The deeper that dip and the lower that dip within the park model curve, uh, that might suggest a more severe event. Um, and it can also give us an indication of how long it's taken for a place to get back to normal. So the speed in which that curve then dips back up um, to normality might indicate whether that's quite a quick recovery or whether it's quite a slow recovery. We could even start to maybe be able to compare events by plotting two lines, one of each event and being able to compare um, one with the other. Um, on the other hand, it doesn't really specify the steps taken before the hazard event. It's just assuming that um, nothing is happening until the hazard event actually occurs. What they both have in common, which uh, we need to consider with their usefulness, is they're both useful in helping us to chart the stages of, of a hazard or the stages following um, a natural disaster. But neither of them actually provide much in the way of quantitative data to show the specifics of each situation. And that's ultimately because they are models. They're trying to represent lots of different situations. Um, and they perhaps don't take into account the complexity that exists after um, a particular hazard. So I'm going to come back to the example of Haiti again, that in Haiti, there was um, quite an extensive outbreak of cholera following the earthquake. 
lots of people cramped into um, refugee camps with very poor sanitation led quite quickly to the spread of um, this infectious disease, cholera. Um, that actually went on to kill several thousand people, but that wouldn't necessarily be represented by that nice smooth line of the park model. The park model in reality might be quite a wavy line as quality of life and economic activity rises and falls um, in response to some of these kind of secondary hazards or impacts. The other thing it doesn't do is take into account spatial variations between or within countries. And we know that actually um, within a country or region, some people or some places are going to be affected more severely than others. And that isn't um, taken into account by these models because they are giving a sort of overly simplistic view of the world. Hopefully that's useful in terms of helping you to clarify this um, purpose and this process of hazard management. Um, make sure you're happy with those different stages of the hazard management cycle and the park model and also the relative successes um, and failures of those models.